everyone. I love that bio. I didn't write it, so it's a huge compliment. Thank you. And I just want to give a big shout out to all the presenters who came before me. So if you could take a second to just sort of like raise your hands. This is, you know, this isn't easy to stand in front of a large crowd. And I know the struggle is real. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Sneha Rao. I'm the VP of product at the New York Times. I'm wearing the t-shirt. This is our symbol. And I lead the developer experience team. And I'm so excited to be here. I have been a part of the product school journey from the get-go. They started about 10 years ago. And I thought of teaching a course. I didn't do it. I thought of uh, talking on a panel. I did do it. And now I'm here. So it's been a journey. So thank you, Product School. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm so excited to share my experience building platform products at scale and how you can do the same. So I invite you to follow this journey. So let's dive in. The New York Times has been a constant source of inspiration for me. So that's why in 2014, when I had the opportunity to join the data science and engineering team as their very first technical product manager, yes, there was a time that they, we didn't actually have a lot of technical product managers, and I happened to be one of the first. Um, and I helped them build the event tracker, which is an internal user engagement and monitoring tool. And several versions have, have come together over the past 10 years, but just being a part of the very first is a very cool anecdote that I like to share. But my passion for data took me to Spotify. As you can tell, I was there from 2016 to 2022, so about a good six and a half years, where I helped them build the data platform. Now, the data platform at Spotify offered a ton of capabilities. Think about data quality, data governance, provenance. I, I could keep going on. I could keep rattling the capabilities that we built. But the end goal of the data platform was to empower data users on their journey for making decisions. You heard Ibrahim talk about all that you can do with data and insights. And it all sort of starts with having the confidence in the data that you're utilizing, that it's trustworthy and that it's worth using to make those strategic decisions. This led to my promotion to the platform as a pl platform product lead, where I grew an incredible team from four to 25 passionate product leaders across the globe. We built cloud-native technologies within Spotify, and we also were hyper-focused on the developer experience. And I will talk about what that is in a minute. But think about the primitives of an infrastructure. Think about compute, storage, networking, perhaps things you're not thinking about on a daily basis. But when you're talking about margins, you better be thinking about it. And that's what we were thinking about. And when you talk about um, you know, championing operational excellence, we worked on observability, reliability, and financial controls. So think about FinOps. This is an emerging you know, industry term, and it's been around for over a decade, and we were working on that uh, at the start. And all of these investments eventually led to the development of a developer portal, which some of you, the enterprises you're a part of may be using. We, we've, we've tinkered with it. It's called Backstage, and my team and I helped develop it. Fast forward, I have now had the opportunity to return to the times, which is a cool boomerang story I like to share. No decision that you take in life is ever like a finite decision. And I'm happy and excited to be back and to contribute to you know, the mission um, that the New York Times has to offer. The mission feels more critical than ever in 2024. I think a, a lot of you would agree with that. Um, so let's talk about the New York Times. I mean, I have to, right? The New York Times has transformed over a decade. If I think back in 2014, it was a print media house to where it is now, it's a digital transformation story. We're not just about breaking headlines anymore, though those are important, but we're offering investigative research, reporting, puzzles, cooking, you name it. That is the power of a platform. 
And that mission, what drives us to take these sort of strategic calls is the belief that the mission for great journalism can change lives. That's what we're about. And our guiding principles and our core values of independence, integrity, curiosity guides every decision that we take, especially when things get tough, and they do get tough often. The New York Times brings you award-winning journalism from investigative reporting, which you're all probably familiar about, to feature stories on fashion, to audiobooks and audio stories, to The Athletic, for sports enthusiasts, for cooking, to wire cutter, to puzzles, to connections. I could keep going on. There's a lot that the New York Times has to offer. But the question you should be asking yourself is, what power is this incredible range of content? Behind the scenes, there's a powerful tech engine that hums. So let's dive in to see what's in the heart of that engine. But before we do, I'm going to take you on a journey, as I would love to do. Have you ever used an app where the click of a button, a swipe, just takes you exactly where you need to be? No questions asked. It's responsive. It just understands you. It's a magical experience. That's the power of a well-built platform. That's what we mean when we talk about platforms something that understands you, that connects with you on a personal level, even though you know you're one in a million that's using that experience. So what does that really mean? The hidden platforms behind the scenes that power those journeys, that include cloud-native technologies, rock-solid apps, uh, smart analytics, a developer platform and a developer experience that seamlessly connects across the board to all of what engineers work through. It's an investment into the engineering journey that is often overlooked, but it is something that New York Times cares about and is investing in. And it is what supercharges those engineers to do their best work. These are the building blocks that um, offer way more complexity under the hood than that meets the eye. But the good news is, once you do invest in these platforms, you will reap the benefits. You will build these delightful user experiences at scale that go across the globe, where a user reading an article in India versus a user reading an article in New York can have the exact same experience. Can we just talk about how magical that is? There used to be a time that wasn't possible. So the fact that you can deliver those experiences at scale, at speed, and you can keep your costs down, you may have heard a shout out on margins. That's what that was referring to. When you have infrastructure that supports everything that you're trying to do for growth, but you can keep your costs in some, in, in within means and within bounds, magic can happen. So we peek behind the window and the curtain, and we've said, all right, there's a lot of complexity. They're hidden platforms that sort of create this, these magical experiences. And that's great. But we've also sort of addressed the fact that there are silos that can be created when you don't do those. So how do you break free? The answer is something I write about on LinkedIn, so if you want to follow me, please do. I talk about a platform playbook, and these are my learnings through my journey of doing this for over a decade. I'm going to offer the first key to this playbook. It's unifying fragmented experiences. So imagine being a diehard sports fan. Imagine caring deeply about the sports that you follow, but having to juggle multiple apps, multiple subscriptions, only to find that daily fix for yourself. It's a big hassle, right? It's not great. That's why we're unifying the experience with The Athletic and The Times, our powerhouse acquisition from 2022. With this acquisition, what we have accomplished is we've complemented the deep journalism, the sports journalism that The Athletic has to offer 
that perfectly complements the sports coverage of the times. Now, the Athletic wasn't quite like this when we acquired them. Uh, there was a time that the Athletic in 2022 it was sort of an island, you know, and had its own app interface, its own web interface, its own subscription login, kind of a hassle for, um, for the user. But now magic happens. So if you're a subscriber of the New York Times and a subscriber of the Athletic, I, I suggest you go on this journey with me. Open your app, click on your browser, type out www.theathletic.com and see what happens. You will seamlessly navigate the, the New York Times offering in one unified view. This is magical because this isn't quite how things work. One subscription login that unlocks the world. Now, why is this a game changer? Well, for two big reasons. Number one, we're using our enterprise infrastructure. We're utilizing things we've already built for New York Times, all those experiences that you know, our users love and, and um, relish and, and, and believe is a delightful experience, is now what athletic, the athletic is built on, the same compute, networking, storage, and the way access controls work all on, on their fingertips, but also the personalization and the real-time analytics that serves and powers the New York Times. So that's the first one. And the second one is it's a business one. It's, it's a wonderful way for end users to finally have one bundled experience all in one place. And it allows us at the Times to tailor our experience to these millions of sports fans and offer them a delightful personalized experience. So to recap, we're going to say bye, goodbye to fragmented experiences. Imagine one subscription login for everything at NYT. Imagine one centralized identity and access management system that helps map out your login, your credentials, but also your reading preferences. Next, we're shattering data silos, one unified data model for our end users. So no differentiation between a newsreader and, and a separate like, user credential for a sports reader. It's all unified. And that ultimately paves the way for those lovable personalized experiences. This empowers them to serve uh, to us to serve users like never before. And by unifying this experience, we, be uh, we believe that we're now well positioned to grow into new segments and new verticals like never before. This is a powerhouse of a data and growth opportunity check. So we've tackled building a unified experience, which seems like table stakes, but guess what? A lot of companies still struggle with. But what if you could dream bigger? What if you could foster network effects and create a, a move from a platform play to networking, uh, a well-thriving network? The New York Times aspires to be more than headlines. We envision the New York Times as a destination, not just to consume con content, but also to actively participate. So think games where you can share scores, and you can you know, create like this competition with your family, and you can have leaderboards with your friends. That's true connection. Remember Wordle and its infectious appeal? That's what we're talking about. People sharing scores and competing with friends, that's the magic of a true network. The more users engaged, the more insights are generated and the better the experience is for all. It's sort of like a snowball. The richer, the more unified the experience will get. So the question is, how do we ignite this sort of network and unleash its full potential? Let's talk about strategy, too. When 
we're building a thriving network. Here are some things I want you all to think about. I'm going to start with a no-brainer that I find people struggle with, no matter which enterprise I work with. This is something that is often overlooked and underestimated. The power of building and testing often. It's as simple as that. Having an efficient CI, CD, and runtime environment where you can test your ideas and you can find the winning bet as often as possible. You know, it's not the, the first, I don't know if you guys have heard of the first idea fallacy, where you think that the first idea that you got was the best idea that you take to market. That rarely ever works. It's perhaps the next 20 or 30 ideas that you work on that really gets you that winning bet. And that isn't really possible if you don't have a seamless way to integrate and to deploy and, and run your experiments often. It also gives product teams the confidence to take various varieties of treatments and audience segments and run those experiments often. And knowing that when they roll out a specific experiment to a specific audience and it doesn't work the way they anticipated, that they can roll that back. That's the power of a good CI-CD platform pattern. And a great example of this is um, what we have done at the New York Times is we run an innovation um, week. Uh, it's called the NYT Maker Week. And we're super proud of it. And I'm sure many of the enterprises that you all represent run innovation hubs. And I cannot emphasize how, how the need for doing those things. Because what it does is it fosters creativity. It harmonizes the way people think. And it provides the latitude to every employee to contribute to the mission. And that is how we develop strands. Can I see a show of hands of anyone who's heard of strands or played with strands? I see a few hands. Thank you. We're super proud of this. This was developed by NYT employees at a game jam. So here's a classic example. By fostering a network effect, we, not, we have now created a powerful flywheel where new ideas can come in, they can be tested and deployed, they can be experimented with various groups, and ultimately, they can have the confidence that scaling in production is not a large orchestration. You don't need all hands on deck, you don't need thousands of engineers working to make something productional. A well-oiled platform can do that for you. And what, what you get in return from a business perspective is that this generates deeper interactions deeper insights, and ultimately creates a thriving ecosystem where everyone wins. So I've covered a lot, but there is one more playbook that if I didn't talk about, I would be doing you all a disservice. So imagine you've built that unified experience, and you've built a thriving network, and now millions of users are flooding in because you've really done something magical. You've created demand. You've grown the engine. The engine's humming at full speed. That's exciting, right? What could possibly go wrong? What could go wrong is you're not thinking about the margins, and you're not thinking about the costs. And this is where many companies will fail, and I hope that they stumble and learn from that. It is a double-edged sword. Rapid growth is a double-edged sword. It's crucial to establish strong governance alongside growth. No tech talk could happen without Dilbert, so here you go. Imagine a world where software engineers weren't bogged down by like low variance workflows, low variance tasks like writing boilerplate code, writing unit tests, just Jira hygiene, things that you know that you need to do to do your job, but isn't quite contributing to the innovation circle. In my experience, most companies and most teams struggle with finding that balance between growth and quality. And it's super essential that they do. And it boils down to a couple of factors, as I mentioned, between low variance tasks 
things that are important but don't necessarily add to the innovation loop and high value innovation tasks. Finding that balance because you, you have to pay down your tech debt, you cannot operate without. And I think Furby did a really good talk about decomming, which is essentially the sort of stuff that isn't you know, exciting to talk about, but I actually celebrate it. It's, it's super important because if you don't, it, it creates a drag for all the engineers that are left with the task of having to work through the messiness of an organization. So let me pose this question again. Perhaps this lonely software engineer who's setting up their development environment and it's taken them three days isn't a great experience, but maybe it was acceptable because it was one engineer. But what if I said that we had 500 engineers or 4,000 engineers or 10,000 engineers who all shared the same experience? How would that change your response? Think about that. So the question I'm really asking is, how do we balance the business needs for growth along with the organizational needs for efficiency? So while rapid growth is thrilling, true magic truly happens when we scale efficiently. Think economies of scale. I know it's a loaded term and it's used often, but it's true. More power, less cost. That's what we're trying to get to. So our third strategy is something I care very deeply about. And it's really not an original. It's you know, reference to things I've read over the, over the years. So the very first bit is stre uh, building stream aligned and platform teams. This is from the book Team Topologies. A big shout out to that book. It has really changed the way I operate and I think, and I highly recommend it to you all. Building a clear structure with focused roles where feature teams are responsible for user experiences and platform teams are built to enable those feature teams in meeting their objectives. It's as simple as that. But all too often, it gets messy. The second bit is friction fighters. I like this. I mean, it makes it cool. What we're talking about here is decommissioning, migrations, tech debt, incidents, security gaps. You know, all of the things, the reality of working in an organization that gets in the way guess what, wouldn't it be cool to have a platform team that could take that on and have that as their mission while you know, feature teams went out there and grew the business and thought about how to create the, the new network effects and lovable, desirable experiences, having someone that's got your back, that's what the role of a platform team really truly is. And the last bit, which is so critical, is smart investments. Platform teams are an investment, and it's a conversation I have very often with my manager who's here in the front row. How do we think about platform investments? How do we think about the ROI of these investments that we're about to make? Just like any financial investment, you need to have a clear goal up front, and you also need to think about the measures for success, the criteria for how you know if you're heading in the right directions or if you need to pivot. That's what we're talking about, having a defined not star metric and knowing when to stop. Like, this is good enough. We're fine. We've fought as much friction as we needed to. We don't need to keep investing in this anymore. By achieving this balance, our platforms become engines of sustainable growth, and we can deliver exceptional experiences. So in summary, you may or may not agree with the tactics that I had to offer, and the tactics will vary, but the principles are gold, and this is my experience. If you think of the three strategies that I spoke about, unifying user experiences, you know, crash the fragmentation, address it up front, focus on new markets that you could go to, network effects, like building the flywheel for your business, and building a thriving ecosystem where those connections are made between users and those interactions that lead to greater insights and better experiences. And finally, think about 
a sustainable growth engine. By achieving this balance, our platform becomes an engine for long-term growth. That does sound wonderful, at least to me. That's the magic of building at scale, and that's all I have for you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>